This is Dr. Andrew Jones. In this edition of Veterinary Secrets, I'm going to be discussing canine hip dysplasia and how you can tell if your dog may have it. Hello you guys, welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new, welcome. Today's video, we're featuring my neighbor's dog. It is Pippi, who is currently checking out my house. She's in search of food. Pippi likes coming to a new kitchen. Good girl, Pippi. <laughs> so what is hip dysplasia? Uh, most of you have all heard of it. I have a pretty good sense, obviously, something going on with a dog's hips. And you get a sense that, that something hasn't formed right. And, and that's essentially what is going on. Um, to begin with, the word dysplasia means abnormal growth. And because it's hip dysplasia, we've got abnormal growth or formation of the hip joint. Um, it's something that is much more common, and the larger the dog, the more common it is. So our larger breed dogs that are rapidly growing are far more at risk, although we can see it in any breed. Typically, the larger you are, the more likely you are to get it. So in terms of you getting a visual of what hip dysplasia is, I'm going to bring up some x-rays so you can actually see exactly what it looks like on x-ray. But if you, if you can imagine the actual hip joint, Pippi is sniffing because she can actually smell what's the remnants of a chicken bone, which I'm actually going to use as a model for this video. I'm hoping she won't eat my model. Okay, good girl, you stay there, Pippi. So if you think about hip dysplasia, the, the hip joint itself, you've got this big bone here. Imagine my arm here is this big bone. It's called the femur. And Pippi, good girl, Pippi. This is her, the big bone along here, right below the hip itself. So it's along this, this big, big femur here. And it fits into a ball, into a, uh, a socket. So the, the end of that bone is a ball, the, the ball of the femur, the, the femoral head, the femoral neck. And that's fitting in to a socket, which is sort of a, a C-shaped structure. If you can imagine that my right hand here is the, the ball of the femur, and it's fitting into this, the C-shaped structure, which is the socket on the pelvis. It's my left hand. They should fit in sort of snug like this. I mean, that's a normal formed hip joint. And if you look up there, in that corner of the video, you can see x-rays of how a normal hip joint should look. The end of the femur, and my left hand is this pippy out. Now that I've stopped Pippi from eating my model, um, I just dug out the, yeah, she's still quite interested. I dug out the remnants of a chicken, and no, they don't have the exact same pelvis that we do, but it's enough at least for us to demonstrate as a model. So if you imagine this bone, this long bone here, this being the femur, and you can see there on the top of the femur, there's this smooth, smooth covering. That's articular cartilage. So that's what allows the joint to, to rotate uh, around each other back and forth. Think of it as a type of oil. So that's essentially a nice soft lubrication. Because you imagine those hips are moving all the time, you know, hundreds or thousands of times a day as you're, as we're walking. Our hip joints or dog's hip joints. So this ball of this femur is going to fit into this pelvis. And we'll imagine it's not a very well-shaped socket. But imagine this is sort of the socket you see in a dog. It's much more pronounced in a dog. It's a much more of a half C shaped. So that's going to fit in something like this. And so normally, you've got smooth cartilage on either side. The, sm the smooth cartilage, that sort of really shiny color, is on the inside of the hip joint here, uh, on the, along the pelvis or the acetabulum, as well as being along uh, the ball of femur, on the outside of the ball of the femur. And as your dog is walking and moving, you know, that joint's going to sort of flex and extend and rotate along that smooth articular cartilage. Whereas in hip dysplasia, you expect it to be fairly firm. It's going to be so when we sort of lie your dog in a bat on their back and take an X-ray, which is one of the main ones we're testing for for hip dysplasia, and we pull those legs back, we expect to see that joint to be pretty tight. There's not very much space between the, the ball of the femur and the C-shaped here, this acetabulum. It should be pretty snug. In a dog that has hip dysplasia, you can imagine. Um, 
The soft tissue all around that joint is essentially not, not developed normally. It's very lax or very weak and it's sort of hanging out, sort of like this. So we might lay a dog on its back and see this big space. It might even be up to a half to an inch apart, where normally we'd expect to see a tight, tight space, sort of like about a quarter of an inch. So in hip dysplasia, because you have this abnormal joint development, what ends up happening is instead of sort of, you know, we're, we're describing this nice smooth joint, one joint articulating with the other joint, as you're sort of expecting here, nice and smooth, in the end you'll end up actually having bone. You, you lose that soft cartilage, you end up having bone rubbing on bone. Then you see all the, the pain, the inflammation, uh, the arthritic changes. And ultimately that's what you're dealing with with hip dysplasia. You've got this abnormally formed joint and you end up having bone rubbing on bone. We lose all that soft articular cartilage. And we have a dog that's painful uh, because they've got these secondary arthritic changes. There's a varying degree of ages of when hip dysplasia is going to first show up. Um, you know, I've seen it in practice, you know, sign, potential signs of it as young as pups, sort of three to four months of age. But it can be anywhere typically from six months on. And there's a real variation amongst dogs in terms of do they have clinical signs or not? Are they obviously lame um, or they're painful? For instance, so I'd see some dogs, they just are real subtle changes. They're clearly dysplastic. And I'll show you another, here's an x-ray up in the corner. shows a, a sign of moderate dysplasia. It has been very painful. Uh, where we, we can have other dogs, for instance, that have much more advanced signs of dysplasia, secondary arthritic changes. Don't, don't seem to be painful at all. So some of the other issues that go around, whether or not your dog is reacting or uncomfortable or not, in part of, part of it would be the development of their muscle mass. So they have secondary muscles. Do so they have nice developed these gluteal muscles, nice, nice developed quadricep muscles, um, the big hamstring muscles, to support that sort of weakened hip. The more developed the muscle mass, and the better able they're able to tolerate that not perfectly formed joint. Uh, and secondary too, another real big factor I notice in practice would be just your dog's weight. So that the heavier dogs are just putting much more force in their joints. Hence, you know, causing more pain, inflammation, and having more clinical signs. So how can you tell if your dog has hip dysplasia? Well, the first big thing you're suspecting is you've got a dog that's lame to some, some degree, especially a young dog. You know, you've got a puppy who's, you know, maybe he's only six, seven months old and all of a sudden he's starting to be lame. I mean, that would be a real big indicator. Um, they have difficulty, you know, getting up after lying down. They're not jumping up. Many of the signs that we talk about in relation to just a dog being arthritic. And if we see secondary changes in an older dog, that may be what we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, some of those signs relating to arthritis, but the arthritis is caused by underlying hip dysplasia. One of the more classic, classic things I did see in practice with some um, some of the dogs is they sort of be a bit of a bunny hop or we see a real stiff movement of their gait. I'm just going to do a little bit of video with Pippi who actually fortunately doesn't have hip dysplasia um, and you'll see what a normal dog is walking like where a dog that has hip dysplasia often they're really rigid with those back legs instead of you know moving them opposite flexing and extending them they're almost hopping because they don't want to put any pressure and they don't want to move those hips in and out because it's so painful. So these guys that have hip dysplasia are, are not able to jump up like Pippi is? Good girl. Hey, Pippi. <laughs> okay, Pippi. And they're sure not able to run like Pippi. So you see her gait, she's, you know, she's not bunny hopping on both of those legs. So you can see on Pippi's gait that she's, you know, freely moving both of those back legs. She's not holding them rigid, bunny hopping. And if you've got a dog that is doing some of those clinical signs, especially a younger dog, you really want to get them, get them examined for hip dysplasia. So what causes hip dysplasia? No question, the single biggest factor is genetics in terms of your dog coming from a line that's predisposed to hip dysplasia. So specifically, you, you don't have that joint forming normally. Obviously the biggest solution to that is you being really thorough in terms of, of if you're getting a puppy, if you're a bred puppy in particular, just knowing is there, has there been any history of hip dysplasia within the line? Um, has the owner uh, had 
the, the dog certifi certified free of hip dysplasia, so then the O of AX race. Um, most of the responsible breeders would be doing that, and I would suggest that you really look into that. Just seeing is there a hi history of dysplasia, because it's such a it can be such a really painful, difficult disease to deal with. And the last thing you want to do is get a puppy that's got this pretty difficult to treat disease. Um, secondly, there's some thought around exercise in terms of one of the studies I read had mentioned that there seemed to be an increased risk if puppies were allowed to go up and down stairs. Uh, before the age of three months. You're putting excessive strain on the hip joints. Um, but another study showed that allowing exercise or running around freely in the backyard decreased the risk of hip dysplasia. So the point being, you don't want to excessively strain the joints, but you do want your dogs to be exercised. Seems to make sense. Nutrition is pretty key in terms of, of hip dysplasia. And if you've got a breed that's prone to hip dysplasia, uh, then you really want to be thinking about what you're feeding your dog. Um, one of the studies showed that dogs that were prone to dysplasia, the, you know, such as the large breed dogs, if they were allowed to free feed, so eat as much as they want, you know, upwards of two thirds of them de develop dysplasia. Whereas if those dogs were given controlled amounts of feeding, so the owners were, were on it in terms of if you get a measured amount at a certain fixed periods of time, not, not allowed to free feed, you know, less than a third develop dysplasia. So once again, you know, reinforcing the importance of nutrition uh, along with, with looking at the breed's specific foods, you know, such as the large breed foods. But more importantly, the big take home mesh is, is not overfeeding your dog, not allowing them to free feed, and not giving them excessive amount of nutrients that are gonna increase their growth. They want moderate growth. The last one I wanted to mention or address is the issue around early spay and neuter. Um, because there is some research now that is showing I me mean, these dogs that are especially neutered and spayed at an earlier age have a higher incidence of hip dysplasia. Um, so we know what's happening then if we, for instance, neuter these dogs too young, their bones are going to keep growing, um, but their muscle mass isn't going to keep up with that. So if you can imagine you've got these long bones, you don't have as developed a muscle mass, guess what? You don't have as strong a form joint. So you can imagine. You imagine if Pippi was spayed very early, the, her bone kept growing, say, an extra, you know, three or four inches. So she's got these much longer legs, but a le much less developed muscle mass. It sort of, if you think about it, conceptually makes sense. You're, then it would make sense why you'd be more likely to develop hip dysplasia. You know, so my thought, and I, it's funny because I had this same conversation with one of my neighbors who's looking at getting a puppy, is I personally, if I've got a, a medium to large breed dog at risk of dysplasia, you know, I'd look at delaying spay or neutering um, to about a year of age. I wouldn't be looking, especially not doing early spay or neuter, and I'd even consider putting it off from the sort of the traditional six month period. The one last thing I wanted to show you uh, in today's video is if you suspect your dog it has hip dysplasia, first of all, get them examined, get them x-rayed. Now that's essentially the gold standard. Um, you can, via x-ray, look at that joint, evaluate the state of it. Um, once again, you just look up into the corner of the video here. Here's another x-ray showing you a dog that has normal hip joints. Um, and the next one is now showing you a dog that has hip dysplasia. But in terms of an examination of your dog, one of the easiest things to do, good girl, Pippi, I'm gonna roll you on your side here, good girl, you, is, first of all, you're just gonna watch your dog walk around. You wanna see a normal gait, such as Pippi, who's now chewing on the stuffed toy I brought in. Um, secondly, too, is seeing the, if, if he or she is uncomfortable when you extend their hips. Um, so what I'm doing with Pippi here, see if I just, you know, I'm supporting the top of her pelvis. Um, my right hand has, has her right knee. And I'm just going to pull her leg straight back. It's like standing your hip. It's a real simple thing we'd often do in vet practice. And any dog that's got any degree of hip pain, they're going to really resist that. Good girl, Pippi. So as you can see, she, she lets me pull her hip straight back. And she really doesn't have any degree of any, any hip issues. But if you've got a dog that, that does, that's one of the sort of easy uh, tests that you can do at home. So your dog seems really sore, you've seen him walk, he seems like a bit of a bunny hop. Go ahead and do that. Um, don't force it, just gently see if he'll let you flex it all the way back. Um, and if you resist, just, just let go. I mean, never go beyond what your dog's comfortable with. 
then get them examined and checked out appropriately. And I advise getting an x-ray to see if you can see if your dog has hip dysplasia. Thank you for watching this edition of NRE Secrets. What I want you to do now is first click down there to like this video. Click up there to subscribe to my channel. Then lastly, go ahead, click, click that link directly in the box below. And then when you sign up for my newsletter, I can send you my free books and videos on how to heal your dogs at home with my top natural remedies.